now we just need to hit recording <laughs> or are we already yeah now we are sorry <laughs> um hi my name is anushka um i work for the international fight movement socialist education international or course the short ifmsci um i'm based in brussels belgium and um i'm gonna host our workshop today so it will be maybe a little less than an hour because we're not so many, but I try to make it interesting and interactive. Um, when you have a question, just raise your digital hand so I know that you have one and then um, I try to address all the questions on the go. So if you have a question in the middle of it, please, please, please ask or put it in the chat. Um, and uh, Lauren, let me know if I lost some questions somewhere because it's also my first time uh, hosting a Zoom workshop. So please have understanding. Um, before we get started, I also would like to acknowledge all the people who are not here with us today because um, historical or societal circumstances are not allowing them to be in these spaces of gathering and learning. And I also want to say, share that most of the knowledge that I'm going to share with you today it was developed by um, young people volunteering for our global project Amplify Youth Voices. So um, just to also share that this is not only my work or the work of IFMSCI, but it's the work of a lot of young people in Canada and Europe who worked on this topic. So well, I'm not good with it. Um, I saw that already some of you did this. I would really appreciate if you could change your name, your Zoom name into your first name, your preferred pronoun, and where you feel local today, um, which can be where you're from, but it can also be like, maybe you feel like you're in a different city today, or you feel like you're on holiday. So please put in where you feel local today. And the pronoun is really important because we want to um, address you in the right way if you're not identifying with the binary um, genders. Um, I already said it would be cool if you could raise your hand to speak or put it in the chat so you stay muted until we unmute you manually and also leave your video on or turn your video on if you're comfortable with sharing your image. Um, it just feels a little bit more human. <laughs> um, be respectful so we don't we try to not swear, we try to use language that is inclusive and appreciative. So it's, for example, we don't say you're stupid, but we say, I don't understand why you say this. So it's really important that we also criticize not the people, but challenge what they're saying. Um, it would be really great. I try to make it a bit interactive. Um, it would be great if you could actively engage within your abilities. Um, but also feel free to stay silent if it's more comfortable for you. And uh, one thing uh, which I always find helpful, turn off your notifications on your phone or your computer so that you really stay present for the hour that we have together. So we also appreciate each other's time. Okay. Um, what we're going to do today, um, so the big um, topic of the session is uh, narratives and counter narratives. Um, I'm going to explain in a moment a bit more what this is and why this is important. But after the whole introduction, we're going to hop on um, Jamboard, uh, where we're going to use uh, sticky notes um, to warm up a bit. Then I, tell, then I will tell you more about the project. Um, and then we're going to go into the work. So we want to talk about narratives and maybe think about which narratives are common or dominant when we talk about different topics. And then we're going to try together to understand counter narratives and evidence based arguments. And we try to turn some of the narratives that we came up into some, some more positive messaging. And then uh, we close. Uh, yeah. Cool. So before I, we start with the content, uh, Lauren asked me to explain a little bit more what IFMSCI is. Um, as I said, it's the International Falcon Movement Socialist Education International. Um, we are a, like a you know, big umbrella organization. So we sit here in Brussels, um, where our office is, but we run activities and projects all over the world. So that's the big umbrella that we're spanning. Um, and for us, it's, um, it's really important that we are a movement of movements. Uh, with this, um, we mean that everything IFMSCI does is um, created and is demanded by the member organization. 
Um, we have in total 46 member organizations in five world regions, and one of them is Woodcraft 4 in the UK. But we also have organizations that are members in, in India, in Mali, in Cameroon, in Peru, in Chile, Israel, Palestine, Turkey. But most of our members are in um, Europe. Uh, we are turning 100 years in two years, so 2022 will be our big anniversary party. And um, because Common Ground got delayed a little bit, um, it's now part of our birthday celebration. And um, we, I hope to see you there again, and uh, then we can really celebrate 100 years uh, of IFMSCI and Common Ground. And really, like we always say, we spend the world with friendship. Um, that's one of our core beliefs is that when we bring together young people um, from all over the world from really different circumstances and we help them or give them space to create friendship um, then we can change the world and um, yeah that's why why I love to work for IFMSCI um, and why so many of Woodcraft folks are active also as volunteers. Um, right now, for example, in our office, we have Nadia Asri, who is um, who's a Woodcraft member, but she's volunteering for a year with us in Brussels. And um, yeah, she really learned international work. But also we had a, our secretary general who left last year. She was also from Woodcraft folks. So it's really possible for everyone, no matter from if you come from a small town or a big city, also to be active on IFMSCI and come to our activities. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things to do. <laughs> Some of the topics that we work on at the moment are climate change. Um, we work on peace education. So we look at how can we work with children on understanding conflict and how can we um, create education that allows them to to um, create more peaceful and inclusive society. We work a lot on feminism and gender equalities and um, yeah, and internationalism and volunteering in general. Okay, does anyone have questions about what Ivan Messi is? If not, I see shaking hands, heads, sorry. Uh, then we go on. So as a warm up, I will share in the chat um, if I can find the share, there we go. The link to the gem board. Um, if you just click on the link and you hop over to the gem board, I have uh, prepared two questions for you here. Um, the one is, um, how is your, where, how's the weather where you are? And the other one is, what do you want to learn today? Um, it can be something you want to learn in our session today, but it can also be something you want to learn anywhere else in life today. So what I would like to ask you is to click here on the sticky note symbol and to create a new sticky note in the color of the question you want to answer. So if you want to answer the weather question, you take a green sticky note and I have, my weather is cloudy, but cloudy and windy. And then you can do the same for the what do you want to learn today question. We have cloudy and warm, sunny but windy. Sunny but windy is uh, the wrong color. You need to switch into green. It's a bit important because we're going to play with this um, again in a moment. <coughs> oh, warm and dry was hiding. So, oh. <laughs> and anyone wants to learn something today? Um, what do I want to learn today? Today, I want to learn um, how to run an online workshop. That's what I want to learn today. Sunny and a bit cloudy blue skies. 
anyone wants to learn something today? Sunny and Windy. I would say one more minute and then uh, we move on to next activity. A bit about media narratives and how, whose side we see in the news, I'll see news from, okay, cool. Again, media narratives, cool. About media narratives and biases and the news site we use. Okay. I think then I prepared the right session for you. Um, we're gonna, gonna look at this, like what are narratives and how, where do they come from? But we're also gonna look at um, how can we make, how can we make counter narratives? So how can we, how can we influence or change what we're going to talk about? Okay, so I promise this is the last uh, me talking alone part and then we're going to get started on the work. Um, so what is Amplify Use Voices? Um, as I said already, it's a two-year project. Um, it's transatlantic, that means we are working with young people in Canada and Europe. Um, we are focusing on three big topics, um, gender inequality, climate change and violent extremism. Um, on the map here you can see all the, the, all the cities or countries that we're in. Um, so in uh, Europe, um, Barcelona, Vienna, Ljubljana and Brussels are our IFMSEI um, local labs. Um, but the other labs are, um, we're partnering with other youth organizations. So in, in Canada, we're working with Apathy is Boring and with Situ and Tejones, which are organizations that work with young people in mostly urban, city, uh, urban cities, so big, big cities. And um, uh, yeah, each of the local labs has decided um, on which, or localities has decided on which of the three big topics they want to work. And then um, we had a three phases process in this project. At the moment, we are in the last part. So we will finish this project at the end of the year. And the idea um, that is behind the project is um, a bit around the narratives as well. So we all have an idea about what gender inequalities are or what climate change is or what violent extremism is. But we, don't, we often don't have the opportunity to think about solutions and then about actions. So we are sometimes good in saying, this is the problem. For example, for um, climate change, we could say, um, we have a lot of droughts in Africa, so the land is really dry and the people can't grow their food. This is a problem that we can describe. Um, but then we don't know how to solve this problem and how to advocate for um, and an action that can be taken by a government or by um, local decision makers. So what we thought for this project is that we give young people the opportunity to raise their big questions about the, the three topics. So um, one of our groups in Austria, they were thinking about how the toys we are playing with um, is affecting our gender identity. So that was their big question. Or um, uh, participants in Canada were thinking about how um, climate change is impacting the indigenous people there. So is it different for the indigenous folks compared to those who are the, the societal majority um, and what are what are answers that is an indigenous knowledge knowledge to solve the crisis so this was the first phase um, our youth champions um, so the volunteers we worked with working with they were running local activities in which they discovered the big three themes and their questions and after this, uh, it was, was like a weekend web uh, workshop. Afterwards, they started to do uh, youth-led research. So they themselves became researchers and tried to understand how the problem actually looked. So um, uh, the, our friends in Austria, they, for example, presented different toys to children and were um, looking at how do different children respond to different kinds of toys, or um, were they were trying to see um, if I if I look at a football, if, do I think of a boy or do I think of a girl? So they try to discover patterns that might just lead to this problem. 
And then last year in November, we came together with over 130 young people in uh, Montreal in Canada. And we brought all of, the, all of the research that the young people did, all of the ideas that the folks had, we brought them there and we said, okay, now that we have so much knowledge in this room and so much evidence and so many questions and ideas, can we come up with solutions? So over four days, the young people discussed and um, asked questions to experts. And um, after the big event, they formulated um, a, youth, a transatlantic youth um, agenda, which is a document listing demands that young people have. So for example, um, the project asks for um, the development of cities that is uh, sustainable for the environment, but also socially sustainable for the people that live there. Um, then we demanded uh, investments into um, out of school activities so that young people um, run a lower risk on radicalization. So it's, uh, it's over a hundred demands. And now in the last phase that we're doing um, right now, it's again the young people coming back into their local labs and they now are planning collective actions. Um, so some people are gonna make um, protests, some people um, are creating zines, so magazines with art from uh, women of color. So it's really different what they are doing, but the idea is um, how can we raise awareness for the, um, the the monster young people have in this project so we are really proud of this project because it's the first time we are we are cooperating with uh, with canada or northern america in general um, because we don't have members there but it's it's really exciting and but also really different so our young people were were a bit suffering sometimes but uh, now that we're at the end everyone is enjoying the journey um yeah I, at the end, I'm going to share with you the, the link to the website. So if you want to learn more, you can also go there. Okay, if there aren't any questions, now we're going to get started with narratives. Um, so, um, narratives, um, if we just look at the word narrative, it could mean a lot of things. So it could be a story that you're telling um, at a campfire. It could be, um, it could be how images accompany words and thereby change the meaning of words. Um, but the definition that we're gonna use um, today in our session is um, a dominant narrative is a statement or a story that gets easily accepted without challenging its content. Okay, what does this mean? So I brought five examples for narratives or dominant narratives here. It could be a meme. So this meme says COVID-19 doesn't affect young people you're not young anymore. With the mean like this, the message that we're sending is, ah, COVID-19, young people are safe when it comes to COVID-19. Or you have a newspaper that says, new migrant flood on the way. So this is a message saying, there are coming about a lot of migrants or refugees, and we're gonna be overwhelmed by it. And it's not giving us anything more, but it gives us the feeling of something really big coming, it's something that threatens the way we live or you have flashy subtitles on news coverage. So this is uh, basically saying uh, a girl didn't qualify for a track championship because trans athletes took the top spots. It doesn't tell us if this girl was ever running before in track or anything else. It's just a narrative that then is used to uh, make uh, arguments against trans people. Or you have something like uh, Donald Trump who just, says that mail-in ballots, so when, when you do the election at home, I don't know if you have it in UK, but in, in Germany and in, in Belgium, I keep voting, voting by post, cool, we have it in the UK. And he just says it's fraudulent. It's, it's, uh, it's gonna be a fraud and people gonna steal the elections. Or you even have research that looks like, research suggests that study after study shows that, oh, sorry, I don't know. I'm really bad with technology. <laughs> so you even have research that is um, used in a way that um, it, gives, it gives an impression of something that isn't true or isn't even shown by the research. What all of this uh, has in common is that it shapes our idea of 
how how a topic is so if we keep saying messages like new flood of immigrants uh, there's a wave of refugees coming at some point subconsciously you start to be afraid of all of these people that are coming and even if you're not really actively engaging with this content you your mind is shaped by it so it's it's really a, important for us to be active when we read news article. Um, what all of these examples also have in common is that they don't show any context or proof. So here it's a meme. It could be this statement about young people could be from everywhere. It could be from a scientist, but it also could be just from someone who wants to say it's safe right now. The same goes for here. There's no context. Um, often it comes with also flashy or simple wording. So like, again, the example with the flat is something that you easily have a picture in your mind or it uses a lot of stereotypes. So here it's kind of like the stereotype that trans people are always stronger than, than uh, cis people. So that are dominant narratives and it's important that um, we are aware of them. Uh, because we see them every day when we turn on the TV, when we listen to the radio, or if we are, um, uh, yeah, maybe even talking to our neighbors, because these easy statements, they also get repeated really easy. And um, yeah, anyone has a question about what a narrative is? Uh, design an out of label for then try to visit. Lauren, I didn't understand that. Can you explain? I accidentally copied the wrong thing. So <laughs> okay. I didn't mean to put it there. Okay, cool. I was trying to copy your link and then I pasted the wrong thing. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Does someone have a, a question about the narratives? No? If not, um, we're going to do a little brainstorming because like all of these narratives that I just gave you as an example about different topics, we have the same narratives about the three topics of, um, of amplifying. So about climate change, about gender inequalities and about violent extremism. And um, we're gonna try to brainstorm now again in the, in the gem board. If you hop back to the gem board on the second page, um, if for those people who have joined since there is, uh, do you want to share the link again? Yes. Anushka, so everybody yes. wants there, to we, there goes the link. Okay. I already, I have already some people. So what I would like to do now is um, here I made the different colors sticky notes: uh, gender inequality, climate change, and violent extremism. And what I would like to do is that you create new sticky notes in the color. So if you want to do something about gender inequality um, and you can just share something you've maybe heard or saw, saw on TV about gender inequality. So for example, um, one that comes to my mind is boys are stronger than girls. That could be something that is accepted by many people. Um, and maybe also some people say, even though I, I, I don't agree. So you can also put examples where you feel a bit like, Ugh, I don't want to write this down. I feel icky. Um, this is just to get some ideas what people say about gender inequalities, about climate change or violent extremism. Um, if somebody feels uh, more comfortable speaking, we can also um, say it and then I type it for the person. <clears throat> so here for climate change we have we have it's not global warming it's it isn't sunny so if the sun doesn't shine there's no global warming Girls like pink and purple and boys like blue and green.
that's something they often say where I'm from in Germany. When it comes to violent extremism, they say all foreigners are dangerous. So that could be an example for a narrative about violent extremism. Gender is the most important thing about a person. Okay, two more minutes and then uh, we stop. Ah, all Muslims are part of ISIS. Global warming. Mm. Um. That's, for example, also something that only affects people in Africa. That's something people say sometimes about climate change. Okay, one more minute and then we hop back and uh, continue. Okay, violent extremism. People of different religions cannot be friends. Okay, now that we have these narratives, I mean, if I look at them, I'm already like, Ugh, that cannot be true. But it's unfortunately something you hear a lot. And you also hear a lot on social media, where like this, this dominant narratives have the most impact on people. Um, but we all can do something about it. And um, one way to, to work on this is, is counter narratives and evidence based arguments. So Similar to um, narratives, counter narratives are also stories and statements, um, but they directly deconstruct, decredit, and demystify a false narrative. That, that, that's, uh, so the idea is that um, with a counter narrative, you give arguments that show the dominant narrative. So, for example, all girl, girls like pink, um, that there's something wrong about this. Or it, it shows that um, the source uh, from which the dominant narrative comes is um, it's not a good source. Like Donald Trump is not a good source for uh, any kind of science. <laughs> or um, it, it um, shows that um, it is an old belief, like uh, boys are stronger than girls. That, that was thought to be true for really long, but science has changed on this and i know uh, i'm a girl too and i'm definitely stronger than my brother so the story with boys are stronger than girls doesn't always work out <laughs> uh, so i also brought some examples for counter narratives oops um uh, for example the one on top here um it's from our use one campaign so this is one of the outcomes that we had for from amplify um, we, we, and well, not we, but the young people with their research and their social solutions, they came up with these demands, as I told you before. So, for example, um, they found that lasting peace, justice, and reconciliation, reconciliation, oh, a hard word for me, um, are important if we want to increase violent extremism. Um, or you have something like um, the European um, uh, 
it's a European agency who put this out. This is a, it's a simple infographic that shows all the wrong stories that are out there about um, COVID-19. Or here, which is from the CDC, um, which is like the health ministry in, in the US, um, who says, look, these are the similarities and the differences between flu and COVID-19, because many people just say, oh, yeah, COVID-19, that, that's like the flu. So these are ways of creating um, a counter narrative. Um, it can also be done, for example, with video, which a lot of people um, do. Uh, because what works best when we do counter narratives is that we use storytelling. Um, with storytelling, I, I mean um, uh, the attempt to make the content or the topic more relatable. So, for example, um, this, this example of the CDC is not a really good example for a storytelling narrative because uh, not many people go on the website and read a scientific text, which can be really difficult to understand sometimes. So um, you could do a video, which is easily consumed, which you could share on social media. So it would go in the same spaces the narratives are. Um, yeah, any question about counter narratives? No? We're good? Okay, now I'm gonna share with you how to make them evidence-based. So an evidence-based argument is a story that gains authority through facts from a reliable source. So it addresses all, all three things that we talked about. It says, this is the, the alternative story that I can tell you. Um, this is from a good source, for example, the health ministry. Um, and these are the facts. So it gives something really, really concrete and not just a, a general something. Um, types of evidence that we can use are, are statistics, so it's numbers um, or testimonials. For example, here it was an article I read um, with the World Health Organization about uh, a COVID nurse who talked uh, about how it was for her to be um, working in a hospital that takes care of COVID patients, but also getting sick herself. So this is a story, a testimonial that shares the truth about an aspect of the, the pandemic. Or you can have an anecdote, which is something a bit more general, like me saying I'm stronger than my brother, that's an anecdote. Or you can have an analogy, which is saying, this is similar to this, or this is different to this, what the CDC did with comparing flu to COVID-19. But something you really need to be careful about um, when you want to make an, uh, evidence-based argument is that you have a good source. So for example, I said the nurse, it's from an article from the, w, the World Health Organization. That's a good source. If I, um, if I just read it on, Insta, on, on Facebook and some random person had posted it and a random person has shared it and there's not really a proof where this story comes from, then it's not really a good source. But also sometimes like anecdotes or um, testimonials, like me saying I'm stronger than my brother, it doesn't really prove anything because it's just one case. It's been me being stronger, is that representing, representative for all female bodies? Or is this just something general? So then it falls into the dominant narratives. Any question about this? I know it's a bit theoretical, but we're gonna try to make it more practical in a moment. So. Let's see how many people we are. Uh, Lauren, could I ask you, after I explained the, the group work, to split us in two breakout groups? Cool. What I would like to do with you, and again, for those that watch it as a recording, you can do it by yourself, um, is we're gonna split you in two groups, uh, not three like I planned, but let's do two. And then you can take up to three uh, narratives from our brainstorming. So all the sentences that we found here about uh, climate change, about gender inequalities, about violent extremism. And you come up with different counter narratives. So you could have an idea that you want to talk about boys being stronger than girls. You want to talk about that this isn't right or this isn't correct. And you could decide to make a video or to make an, uh, a poster or to write a story 
That could be your, the way you communicate your counter narrative. And then you should think about what kind of, of evidence do we have for this? And where could this come from? So for example, an organization that has worked on the topic, it could be your school book, um, it could be uh, your own to as a scientist. So really try to think about where you can get evidence from. And then we're gonna present it. And um, yeah, in the breakout rooms, you can really talk. So you can switch on the microphone and have a conversation. And I would say we take 10 minutes for it. Is that okay? And is it clear for everyone what we're gonna do? So you pick a topic and then you pick three, maximum three uh, narratives and you change them. Okay. Lauren, can you break us into breakout rooms? <laughs> Naturally, like just because they li like colors that I find them pleasing, but I don't think it has anything to do with um gender. Yeah, yeah. In my opinion, I'd say that like your favorite color can when you're really little, because like when I was six, so uh, gender equality and violent extremism right yeah the other group just to let everybody know is talking about their favorite colors so i guess that's a good place to start of which colors do we think are mostly aimed at boys or people who identify as boys and which colors do we think are identifiable for girls and does that matter what is everybody's favorite color who's here Green. Green is my colour. Green is your colour. Well, yeah. mine's, mine's definitely yellow. What would yours be, Tomasa? Mine is green as well, I think. Yeah. And hopefully Chike can tell us as well. I think you can put in. And then we can work out. Yours is green as well, Tommaso. Yeah. And we've already established it's not about volunteers, it's white. White, yeah. Nice. So maybe a little discussion about whether we think that those colours are... And uh, I would like to invite now one person of each group um, to tell a bit about what you talked and what narrative or counter narrative you, you chose to work on. and. Uh, also to share some evidence that you were finding or in source that you were having. Is there anyone who wants to start for one of the groups? Gracie? Yeah. Well, our group was working on the narrative of girls like pink and boys like blue. Um, and we um, had, it was Gregory, uh, we had um, testimonies, because my favourite colour is blue, and Gregory's favourite colour is pink. So that's two automatic things that show that that's not always the case. Um, so we, we talked about how shops have still like having a girl section and a boy section and it's really hard to find for instance pink in the boy section and like blue and green in the girl section and um we we're talking about how the clerks and um, they have they've been doing it by age groups rather than by um gender and i think that's really cool I don't know if is there someone who wants to add because I think we lost Gracie uh, but one idea they had or we, we shared together for evidence could be that you go into a lot of stores and you count the clothes because Gracie had the great argument that actually it's not the gender who 
will pressure sons into colors, but it's the it's like peer pressure that it's like not available if you're a girl or when you can't pick your clothes, people just buy you the pink one because that's all that's available. So for example, to find an evidence that this is a thing, you could go to a lot of stores and count. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Grace. See, now you're back, you were frozen on my screen. I, was, I didn't know if I lost you. Um, from the other group, someone wants to share. I'll share that we were also talking about favourite colours um, and Dora was sharing that her son's favourite colour is not blue but wouldn't mind wearing blue but she doesn't always dress him in blue and Sheke was saying that his favourite colour is white because that's a colour of peace but that our favourite colours change as we grow up and Tommaso was saying that he's had a lot of different favourite colours over the years as well. So that it's not, as you say, about your gender necessarily, but maybe about how old you are or what you like at that time, or maybe what sports team you like to what colors you like rather than uh, just your gender. Yeah, and that, that's like, like to have this personal anecdotes or this personal stories make the topic relatable. It's like, it's the same for like for violent extremism, we had the narrative that people from different religions can't be friends. I mean, we can all check in our friendship circles. Do we have friends who have a different religion? And do we actually ask our friends if they ha what their religion is? But because I have a lot of friends where I don't know if they're Muslim, Christian, or if they're non-believers. So yeah. it's also trying to illustrate what is the role of this, like the same for the gender and the color is gender actually the thing that make us think away or behave away what what are the the things that are important to us when it comes to all of these statements um yeah and we have another session starting so we're gonna wrap this up real easy and i think i'm on time because everything i still want you to do is to go back to our gem board oh no i send it privately for closing we hop over to it. I have to share my screen. I don't know how to share my screen. I oh, know. There we go. Uh, because our gem board has a third page. And on this third page, I would like you to put um, something that you learned. It can be one thing or it can be m many things. And something you would have liked to learn more about or that you're curious about now. So for example, if you would like to learn more of, about how you can get evidence about things. So you can add just some sticky notes there. Um, I want to thank all of you while you're putting sticky notes. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, I, think, I hope it was a bit of fun. <laughs> and I hope you learned something. And um, yeah, my wish would be, if I wish something for us is that we have a bit more like an alarm system when we read things or when we hear things, it's like, huh, what is the source of this? Uh, well, what, why is this in this way? So I think it's it, this kind of sessions where you reflect on things that you read in media or that you hear in media, they really train your alarm system because some things keep uh, popping up over and over again, especially right now with a pandemic um, that don't have been like this in, in modern history or um, with the whole um, societal systematic racism that we are facing. Um, I think especially in these times, it's important to have your alarm system on. Um, you can take your time putting sticky notes. Um, but I want to say thank you for you being here. Um, a big round of applause to all of you for, for sticking with me. I hope I didn't bore you too much. And um, thank you, Lauren, for organizing this. And um, on the pink post-it, you can find the link to the website of the Amplify Youth Voices Project. So if you want to learn more about Amplify, just go there. 